announcement regarding the public notice and meeting. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, in order to the place these committee meetings was publicized by notifying the area news media, by updating the OPD website, and by mailing such notice to each of the direct district's directors on August 9, 2013. Additionally, a copy of the open meetings law and copies of the agenda for today's meetings are available for inspection. In case anybody's wondering, Director Gay and Mine is going to be here with us today, this morning. Uh, so, we're ready to start. Uh, we'll start off with the finance. And Director Kevin. Okay, we have uh, five reporting items for this month. First one is a quarterly uh, report on the company retirement plan. We're aware that the company already knows the district has a uh, finance and retirement plan, which the board directors are responsible for modeling the plans and best performances. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Instead of fighting back. 
Right. That that was my point earlier. Right. The long term. Yeah. Yeah. Our next item is the legal fee that the special court, the second quarter this year. You'll we'll see our, uh, our fees for our general counsel for our driver, and also the fees and expenses for our special counsel law, the AG law, which uh, was involved in our recent coal transportation negotiation issues. Uh, next item. The annual report of the interest rate that uh, we pay our customers. Uh, and, and this is basically for folks that are on the level playing. It would be interesting if you see it on the level playing. This is what it's going to be. Well, it? well it's, it's people who have put the bonds <coughs> down to receive service. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. And, uh, and so, so to, to make sure that if, if there's a credit issue, that if, if bills aren't paid, then we have at least some portion of that bill available to go offset what is paid. We we don't pay interest on if anyone has any type of uh, balance on level. It would be a minuscule amount. There is no interest. On that. No. Well, anyway, this the the interest for the, the folks on, the, on their on their customers on their security deposits you know, for uh, for this year is uh, going to be uh, one quarter of a percent. The district says that the interest rate should be paid uh, on deposits on an annual basis. Um, the interest rate is based upon customers paying, is based on paying the customers 90% of the one year's average savings on these deposits run to the nearest quarter percent. Obviously, interest rates are very low on state plans right now. And um, uh, the monthly yields fluctuate during the year from a high of about 0.31% uh, to a low of about 0.18%. The criteria for the first quarter percent, it, it is a quarter percent. Mm -hmm. Not a whole lot, but we are paying folks a fair amount of money. Just out of curiosity, I know I've heard this before, but if a customer, typically a new customer, I imagine, puts down a deposit of whatever it is, three or four hundred dollars or something, do they eventually think they are religiously paying their bill and do a good job? Do they get that back then? Is that how that works? Right, exactly. For a uh, <coughs> residential customer, uh, they'll get that back within a two-year period of time. Uh -huh. And so if they pay by the bill due date after two years, they'll get that deposit back. And that's when this with interest is applied. That's right. And if they would move, so they've been a long-term customer, they would move, there is no deposit on it. Uh, typically not. If they're moving to, if they've already established that deposit and they currently don't have a deposit and they're moving to a new place, we typically don't charge a deposit. Mm -hmm. And if they move from the city, they get the accrued interest. Uh, they get it at that rate that we were just talking about. So anyway. And these funds are saving. That's true. Right. And then just one, what, what is for a residential homeowner, what is the average security deposit? It, it's probably what we typically try to do is take the two, two months, uh, two highest months of the year. I think we're trying to do that at a flat right now. So it's like... Uh, Two hundred fifty dollars, two hundred twenty-five dollars a month. So two hundred fifty dollars is probably the average residential deposit that we'll do. Certainly for a small apartment complex, it may be a little different, but uh, uh, that would be an average. As a new customer in the last two years, I can attest to that. Very good. Obviously, I'm trying to be immediately saw right away.
is prudent and the fees are attractive to today's market. I just have one question about Edward. Edward, what's the definition of commercial paper? I know in law school I took a class entitled commercial paper, but it, it's a short-term variable rate uh, instrument that can be sold in the market and traded anywhere from, depending on the, the specifics of the program that you have, anywhere from one day to 207 days. And so what we do is we roll this commercial paper, this instrument, and let's just say it's set on a seven-day renewal. You, we go out into the market and we find someone that's willing to buy this commercial paper for seven days. We pay them the, the going market interest rate on the paper. And then when it rolls back around for renewal, then they can either re-up and keep their money in that paper or we can find someone else to pay us. So the benefit for us is it's very flexible because it can be taken out on these renewal dates. In other words, we can pull it back and pay it off. The risk for us is that somebody could decide not that they didn't want it, and we would have to pay it off. Okay. So we provide this credit line behind it in the event that it's put back to us. Something happens in the market, interest is not there, no one wants to buy the commercial paper. We have a line of credit we can draw on to pay it off, pay the investor off, so it doesn't come in and hit our liquidity. But commercial paper programs are very uh, beneficial when we have large capital programs. We, we have, we're not, we, we use this a lot when we're building large generating facilities. And what you can do is, is, is pay this down and then pay for the capital expenditures as you incur them. And then go take permanent financing and then pay the commercial paper company. Oh. So it's a, it's a very good short term, uh, low cost uh, financing. Be a okay, thank you. Okay, our final item is our uh, monthly financial statements. Retail uh, revenue for the month of July was uh, $106.8 million, which is about 9.1%, about 9.1 million or 7.8% of the budget for the day revenues were $531.5 million, which was $5.1 million, which is about 1% <coughs> over budget. A lot of this is obviously retail sales being down in case you uh, the weather. What was the figure you had as far as the, the cooling days or cooling degrees for the month? The cooling degree days, uh, is, was, they were 12% under, which means the weather overall for the month was below normal. We had, we had a hot period in the month, but we cooled off at the end of the month. For the month in total, it was less than the weather was cool. It appears August is kind of It started the same month. Okay, our off system sales for the month of July <coughs> was $10.2 million, which is about uh, $5.9 million on the budget. Year to date off system sales revenues uh, were about $63.6 .6 million, uh, which is about $30 million on the budget. Our OM. Less fuel power for the month. In uh, July it was uh, 43.9 million dollars, which is uh, 3.4 million or 7.3 percent under budget. Year to date, non-fuel OEM uh, expenses were 302.6 million dollars, which is uh, about 7.4 million dollars under budget. The regulatory accounting adjustment for Fort Gallatin Station recovery costs is 4.4 million for the month of July and 114.3 million. In total, which includes the adjustment in 2012. <coughs> Fuel and purchase power for the month was uh, $31 million, which is about $1 million uh, under budget year to date. Fuel and purchase power expenses were running $171.4 million, which is about $4.9 million or 2.8% under budget. Net income for the month of July was $24.3 million, which is about $10.1 million on <coughs> year-to-date net income. Uh, running was a, was a uh, right now is a, a loss of four hundreds of a million dollars, which is about forty thousand dollars, forty thousand dollars, which was uh, about thirteen point six million dollars under budget. Net income. Or, Net income for 2013 
the budget would be $52.2 million. The current 2013 net income projection remains, remains unchanged at that $52.2 million uh, figure. That's based upon a third quarter restart of Fort Calhoun Station. We do not anticipate an additional rate increase in 2013. Capital expenditures for the month were $11.2 million, which is about 2.7 million, 19.3% on their budget. Year to date capital expenditures were $100.6 million, which was about $4 million over budget. Our cash balance, in, uh, the unrestricted cash balance at the end of July was $233 million, which was about $4.4 .4 million over budget. <coughs> cash balance excludes $15 million in restricted uh, rest city to participant funds. Anyone has any questions about our financial? We're looking to have um, some more updated financials in the year. Would you like to hear part of the year? Will be here to join you? Yes. I'll hear it there. I'm assuming under the off system sales, since these have been down for a couple of years, the thirty percent is reflective of how fast that uh, the off system sales are dropping. As opposed to uh, its availability of power to sell mm -hmm. and some pricing variances as we go through. It's not just kilowatts, it's dollars. It's not making as much. Not generating as much revenue. And not having the ability to tell. There's nothing to sell. Yeah. It's an interesting market right now. Yeah. You know, what's not so reflected in here is how the company has sort of um, cut the budget in other areas. You know, and the uh, you know, main machine in the rest of the well, we do do it for right now, we'll turn the budget to uh, production. Or to make sure that we, again, don't have any rate increases this year. Because that we can make sure that we're still looking healthy financially, which you'll see. So that's that's our financial report. That's what we do. Thank you. 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 There was a public meeting on July 24th. It was uh, that was the same time in the previous meeting, and we had the front. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details about uh, all the different things that have been closed, but 11 all are will be closed, and 22 are still being inspected. However, those 22 being inspected, a lot of them are just, in the end, it's so frustrating for me, but it's, it's paperwork and uh, stuff that needs to be done. And uh, that is. Uh, We'll have a report on that and how, how we're doing and making progress toward that. Uh, I am want to mention that we do have we have a new ERC Region 4 administrator, and this is the third one since we uh, had the Fort Calhoun uh, now, which is uh, sort of out of the ordinary. Uh, region 4 administrators of the different regions don't even change that quickly, but uh, we already have a new region administrator, Mark Cross. Uh, he, I don't think, takes his leave until for another month. So we have a, a new deputy region administrator. It's, and he's also, new. what's his name here? Steve, Steve Reynolds is going to be uh, here for the next month. So, so our uh, team has got to do a lot more introductions, a lot more communications. And uh, certainly this is going to slow us down. Uh, we have some concerns about that. Uh, next, I think we have Lou really give this report. <clears throat> All right, good morning. The plant does remain in cold shutdown, but with fuel assemblies loaded in the reactor, priorities remain safe and human performance. Fix the plant, corrective action program, and training. And probably the best way to illustrate that is uh, last week on Tuesday, we had 90 plus mile an hour winds with the storm cell that came through. Uh, that does hit the threshold for a notification of unusual event, which we did notify uh, both the states and counties and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Overall, the plant responded very well. Uh, no safety human performance issues, no real issues inside the plant. Uh, we did lose power to the outbuildings. That includes our uh, train building as well as our administrative building. Uh, and probably the, the biggest impact that happened to be the, uh, the day of our biannual 
uh, graded exercise for the emergency plan. I can't make this up sometimes. Um, and that, so that included quite a bit of you know, planning with states, counties, uh, FEMA as a joint exercise, as well as four additional inspectors. Uh, well, needless to say, we did not do the exercise that morning, in part because the simulator was down for a good chunk of the morning. Uh, but also in part as we responded to the actual event and obviously the safety of the employees um, and recovery from the issues that we did have. But it was a good reinforcer for some of the tourism work that we're doing. Um, you know, some, uh, some minor damaged trees and light poles outside, the, outside of the plant proper. And uh, we're working right now with the uh, with state and counties and FEMA to reschedule on by any exercise. We expect to do that in the December time frame. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, we did uh, load the reactor and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Uh, we did transition out, out of outage work hours uh, rules with the majority of the staff. That was on last Friday. That was a 60-day window that we leveraged uh, to get quite a bit of work done. Uh, no impact in the short term on uh, just by the virtue of uh, the amount of physical work that remains is primarily in the area of tornado missile protection. And, and we're working with the iron workers in particular of, of how we do that on, on nine-hour work days with uh, round-the-clock coverage on that critical task work. Um, the other big issue that we're working through right now is uh, following completion of the, uh, of the fuel reload. The next step in reactor reassembly is placing the upper guide structure. That's some internal components of the reactor. Uh, and we had an issue with uh, the seeing of that, uh, fully of the tool that surrounds that structure. And it basically goes down uh, over, over two guide pins that are 180 degrees out on the reactor vessel. One guide pin actually is a little bit higher than the other. And we had, uh, it's basically an outrigger that, that hung up on one of the two pins and it caused a little bit of damage to that, to that outrigger. So what we've done is we've removed that second outrigger and uh, we get quite a bit of industry help uh, as well as uh, fleet help right now. There are plants that do this uh, evolution with no outriggers. Ours is actually a pretty advanced tool. There's plants that have done it with one and uh, that's the current situation that we're in right now. So we're working on making sure that that, uh, that, that component is level, that the outrigger is level. Uh, and through a series of underwater cameras and some laser measurements, we're methodically going through uh, replacing the uh, upper guy structure back in the vessel. And we anticipate doing that tomorrow. We did some dry runs on Saturday, quite a bit of infield measurements, uh, as I mentioned, with uh, you know, picture that we're, we're doing this uh, you know, fairly heavy lift, about a 67,000 pound lift, you know, under about 20 feet of water. And uh, I just want to make sure obviously that's lined up correctly as it, uh, as it goes into the vessel. Uh, tornado missile protection modifications continue. That's our, that's our long lead item right now. Uh, we've completed the items for core reload. We've completed the items that will support drain down the vessel uh, and put the head on uh, once we complete the upper guide structure installation. And really the, the bulk of the other work across all, all of our important safety, uh, important safety pumps is complete uh, with the exception of one of our raw water pumps. We're finishing that rebuild, uh, finishing that rebuild this week. Uh, the containment penetration feed through is installed and post maintenance testing continues, and that's really a function of different plant conditions that uh, allow the rest of those electrical circuits to be tested. Uh, the containment internal structure project uh, continues uh, with the analysis and operability evaluation that has been approved and is under inspection by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission at this time. Uh, transitioning to uh, regulatory side, as mentioned, uh, the new regional administrator for Region 4, Mr. Mark Paul, will be on site this Thursday and, um, and is discussed. He's in a transition phase right now, um, and, and his intent is to visit all the Region 4 plants, but we'll be number one out the shoot. Uh, so he'll be on site all day Thursday with our branch chief, uh, very similar to the commissioners uh, that visited. We'll spend the day, a good chunk of the day, out in the plant, uh, looking at the physical work and able to look people in the eye. Uh, that will include containment tours as well as uh, you know, the other extensive amount of work that's been done over the last year and a half. And that's really the challenge we discussed this weekend. It's not only the work we're doing now, but just to portray everything that's been done from you know, manhole work from last year to the use of generators to the, just the physical work that's been done at the plant. And, uh, and so that will be, that'll be our goal in that discussion on, on Thursday. Where, where was he previously? Uh, at um, uh, INSERV, which is part of the I'll say the security side is his most recent assignment. And then uh, prior to that, I spent time in both Region 1 and Region 3 of the senior levels. But uh, in service, I believe, is the most recent uh, most recent. Position. Well, it is good news that he's going to be there at that soon. It was just a point out he's here already, which is good. Yeah, yeah, that's encouraging. We had an opportunity to, uh, to brief the commissioners, all five the commissioners, about a week and a half ago, and I had an opportunity to spend a little bit of time with Mr. LaFong as part of that, uh, part of that meeting in Washington, D.C. Yeah. 
Uh, with respects to inspections, um, good sized team in part in June, but 14 inspectors uh, in the early part of July. Uh, we've got a uh, we've got a debrief scheduled for Friday. With really the, the messages there is granularity by inspection checklist item, you know by inspection basis item, you know what is uh, what is the status of each one of those, um, and if there is ongoing actions or commitments, what do they look like? And, uh, and tied to that, we did docket um, we did docket our plan for sustained improvement on July 30th, and that's really a vehicle as we've worked with the inspectors that you know in many cases we would read. But here's the pre-restart component, here's the post-restart component. And so that lists our commitments on the post-restart side and affords uh, the inspectors the opportunity to say, yes, understand that completed here and see what the path forward is. And so we're expecting a very granular debrief uh, with the inspection lead, the branch chief, uh, on Friday morning. Uh, exit meeting for license renewal, uh, no significant issues. Actually, uh, on August 9th, we entered the period of extended operation, which is a big deal, obviously, for the site and all the preparations for, uh, for license renewal. Uh, no significant issues with the NRC residence by quarterly inspection. And we had a small team. One of the things that we've been working through with the inspectors uh, and tying back to the bus fire, uh, all things bus separation. So we had some inspectors that came back out from headquarters uh, in part, looking at our NFP 805 application, which is the new you know, fire standard that uh, a good majority of the industry has gone to, uh, and just we looked at our risk assessment on there in lieu of the event that we had last uh, uh, June of 2011, excuse me, uh, with no significant issues as far as how we've analyzed the risk inside the plant. And uh, as we've uh, you know, talked about all along, both in the public setting as well as in inspections, you know, the, the design issue that we had with the implementation of the uh, 40 volt bus modification was the root cause and we had fixed that design issue uh, and that provides adequate separation for us at that level. Uh, we did work through the, uh, as, and actually had some discussion in a public meeting about an exigent license amendment request uh, and that was in support of the work that we're doing for tornado missile modification that allowed us to adopt the modern guidance. Uh, probably the biggest thing that we're still working at under that is um, part of the process that the NRC will use uh, is to look internally uh, at why an exigent license amendment request. So there's a lot of discussion up front, a lot of discussion throughout the process about uh, you know, the 50-59 process as well as um, the operability evaluation process, which we believe we were solidly in both of those places. And so the NRC will work with, uh, work with NI and we expect to hear feedback not only in support of Fort Calhoun, but in support of the industry of why uh, the NEI guidance you know, was not applicable um, for, this type of, uh, for this type of situation. Uh, we all really don't want to be in the connection of the amendment request uh, process if we can do it. But uh, that, did, uh, that did work through about a, about a five day delay from where we originally anticipated to do before we look. I uh, mentioned the plan for sustained improvement. Uh, one of the things that's tentative right now is uh, we'll be down at the region on August 27th uh, to, do a, to do a presentation on that plan for sustained improvement uh, with a broader audience of, uh, of region form management, uh, in part, again, to see what path forward looks like for us. I uh, mentioned the public meeting on the 24th. Uh, so I also mentioned we're back to visit all five commissioners uh, a couple of Fridays ago. Uh, and who was on that team? That was Lowell and Gary. Yeah, Susan Randall and uh, Keith Curry, who's our regular vice president from Excellence. Yeah. And you got to actually go visit all five. All right. yeah, one day. In one, one day, do you separately or at one time? Separately. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, inspections going forward will be smaller teams that will augment the residents. And uh, like I said, expect to have that level of granularity. Uh, with the Newton Regulatory Commission based on our debrief on Friday. Um, the number of info interactions that we've got scheduled, we've got some support this week on configuration management uh, as part of uh, work that we're doing on the license and design basis. Um, we've got the info CPM that will be out in a couple months and uh, still on track for our accreditation visit in the month of November. I think that's the highlights. And as far as handling all of our outstanding CRs and paperwork, we've got one mention that as far as uh, yeah, good, people. Good question. As we work through the physical plant, uh, we've also put together what we call the paper plant outage control center, and that's looking at all things, work orders, and making sure as a piece of equipment comes back that all of the work orders are bundled, the right people are there, so we start a piece of equipment once, once from the retest standpoint. 
And then on condition reports, the subset of engineering, and even the subset of that design engineering, we've augmented that staff on to just scrub, which we don't want to scrub, and say what's you know, pre and post restart, but just to make sure there's not either a, an action at a high level or an embedded action underneath that's uh, that we're missing right now. So that team's been in place for several weeks. Uh, no major discovery items, we've got to get it uh, we got to get the paperwork closed. Thank you. Appreciate it. Voting Talk about nuclear oversight. Sure. Uh, the independent nuclear oversight continues to inspect, evaluate, and, and audit uh, the work at Fort Calhoun. Uh, Lou uh, talked about all the high issues, uh, the high level issues, and, and all the, uh, uh, the, uh, the big item work that we're doing. So I'm not going to focus on that. I'm just going to take a couple, maybe a couple minutes, and talk about the detailed work that the nuclear oversight is doing. And mainly just to give you a little bit of perspective of, of, of what the 20, 22 people are doing in the field every day. Uh, now going forward, I probably will not mention all the, you know, the detailed work that we're doing. But but for now, I thought it's probably a good idea. I think it's a good time. idea because a lot of people don't still are having trouble on what the nuclear oversight committee does. So I think that's. Sure, sure. Uh, as I mentioned, we have about uh, a, a, a 20 uh, employees out there. They're really watching all the work that's being done every day, including the uh, uh, permit missile protection, uh, the HALBQ work. Uh, any work that the line uh, at Fort Calhoun is doing uh, is being uh, uh, monitored, assessed, evaluated by the nuclear oversight. And, uh, and we are in alignment with all the, the, uh, the work that uh, Lou has mentioned and, uh, and talked about. Uh, so what I'm going to do, uh, just kind of give you, and again, a little bit of a, of a perspective on the detailed work that we're doing out there. Uh, the nuclear oversight, since we met last time, has completed 253 inspections, and that uh, includes about 65 uh, well inspections uh, that were done. Now, some of those, uh, once we do that, we evaluate that, and then we either uh, accept the work that's being done or reject it, or we say that's un unsatisfactory, and then that work has to be redone. Uh, so some of those uh, in the water inspection have been uh, challenging, and we have, uh, uh, you know, out of the 65, there is a, there is a number that uh, came back as uh, unsatisfactory. Uh, we also completed about 20 mod, uh, modification package. Uh, we reviewed those. Uh, we also uh, completed about 41 predictive activities uh, in the field. In, uh, the predictive uh, maintenance activities that are done, those are different than the routine maintenance uh, that are being done or the time-based maintenance. Those are basically uh, techniques that are uh, that would predict the kind of maintenance that we need to do ahead of time. And so uh, those are really important to complete. Uh, I'm going to mention just a few areas uh, that are on the top manager concerns of nuclear oversight. And uh, we've got about eight of them, but I'm going to mention only a couple, and mainly because most of those have been addressed, uh, and uh, we're kind of monitoring the, the uh, response and also the progress. So I kind of view out of those eight, six of them are really uh, uh, we're making a lot of progress on them, and the response that we're seeing from the line and the leadership at Fort Calhoun is, is very good. So I'm just going to mention two of those. In, uh, one of them would be the well process control that we have in place. Uh, we do believe that we're seeing a lot, a lot of what we call, and Luke could jump in uh, uh, if you can clarify that uh, also. What we're seeing is, is what they call arc, arc strikes, and that's, you know, I'm not an expert on that, but that's uh, doing the visual examination of the welds in, a, in accordance with the Fort Cajun Station visual weld examination criteria. Uh, arc strikes are not acceptable, and those welds will have to be done. And from what I understand, basically, when we're doing, when they're doing the, the welding, uh, the, the arc is struck, but the, the spot is not welded, and that's due to maybe it's overheated beyond the specifications. So that's an area that we pay a lot of attention to. And again, I'm not going to, you know, in the future talk about all the detail, but, but I do want you to get uh, a little bit better appreciation of what's going on out in the field. Uh, so that's an area we're, we're concerned about. We're communicating to uh, the line management, uh, and uh, things are improving. The other area I want to talk about a little bit is the 
the need for quality assurance record control to improve. Uh, and, uh, and again, that's an area that I think, yeah, uh, that we're making progress and we have a, we have teams in place and I think uh, with the transition to the Exelon model, that's really being resolved and, and we're seeing a lot of progress. But the, the reason this is really important be for two things, you know, of course, uh, you're having to do rework. Uh, if you're not documenting everything as a quality assurance uh, 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 item, then you're having to redo, redo the work, and that takes a lot it's of time. It's not written down. It's not done. Right. So right. Yeah, yeah, Which is probably true. where we've gotten in trouble previously, by not having added to take the work. That was a big bad habit. If you go and look at our corrective action or what we've done wrong, it's the paperwork, you know, has not been followed up, you know, as far as saying what we have done in the documentation. So this is very important. Correct. That we are and I think it's much, much improved from what we've had previously. I believe so. I believe we've made a lot of progress. And, and uh, also from my perspective, from the nuclear oversight perspective, you know, we're always looking at the, the glass, you know, the, the, the empty half. So it's really, we, we tend to focus on the, on the very few negative areas, but that's not to say that, that there's a lot of progress that... Uh, there's much progress made. being done. Yeah. I think this is almost, this is a positive thing though too, and that this will prevent future problems. Absolutely. A uh, couple more things I'll, I'll mention than, uh, than that be it from the report. Uh, the nuclear oversight also elevated two issues. And uh, I've mentioned the elevation process before. That's when, when the nuclear oversight uh, uh, group is working with the managers of certain department and they're not happy with the response or with the progress. Uh, they have a process where they elevate that issue to the plant manager, with the, with the, which would be Mike Rospero. And then we have another uh, uh, level, which would be an escalation, and that would be when I would escalate the, the issue to Lou, Gary, and Thunderbolt. Uh, right now, we believe a lot of these issues are, uh, are in progress. We're making a lot of progress. Uh, the response from the line has been very good. Uh, but we did elevate a couple issues, and that those are about 30, 35 days old. So since then, they have responded and they have uh, uh, made a lot of progress, but, but uh, I'm glad to mention those two. Uh, the one issue, the, the first issue we elevated was on uh, uh, on the Fort Calhoun Station maintenance management. Uh, they, they need to uh, perform what we call a quality control of all points. And, and to do, we need to do that uh, so we can provide the quality control inspections. And I'll give you an example. If you're building a house, uh, you don't wait till the end to get the inspectors to inspect the wiring and the plumbing. So you get to a point and where you have, okay, we need to stop, we need to bring the inspectors, inspect what the, you know, the, the work that was completed, and, and then move on. So that, that's been an issue in some areas. Even though the work has been uh, uh, very good and everything is fine, that we still need to have these whole points so the inspectors can come in and inspect that before the work can continue. And again, we've made a progress there, uh, and this is all that, uh, that I, I wanted to mention that. And the last one I want to mention is the, uh, the elevation that we did for the engineering department need to take appropriate actions to correct the CAP behaviors, and the CAP is the uh, corrective action a program that we put in place, and that's what you were talking about a little bit earlier, that we have a lot of uh, condition reports, and those condi condition reports need to be closed before we can heat up and start the plant. And when we looked at historically how many we had been able to close, we were concerned that we're not going to be able to close that. Uh, I believe, and as Lou explained, we, uh, we've addressed this issue, we're happy with the response, we're happy with the progress, that we're also going to monitor that to make sure that we continue to make progress. Uh, and that includes the additional 16 FTEs we put in place, includes the plan we put in place to get those done in a timely way. Uh, so overall, the nuclear oversight continues to look at things with a very critical eye, uh, but also recognizing that, that the response has been very good and the progress has been very good. Okay. Yeah, just two things from my perspective. You know, one of the NOS and nuclear oversight was one of our fundamental performance divisions in which has been coached by the NRC. And, and part of that process now is, is when we're doing the audit side, for example, uh, we're following the fleet templates and, and we're just completing a design control audit. 
and, and part of that fleet template is there will be at least two other sites doing the same audit at the same time it's on a six week cycle. So that team gets with at least two other plants every day to talk about issues that you know we're seeing across the fleet and that uh, that just opens up not only our eyes but just opens up and, and goes both ways. So stuff that we're seeing here that we can help the, the rest of the fleet with. And the other element that Mo talked about and it's probably the biggest change and I saw it during our uh, radiation protection audit exit where the line manager as much does that debrief presentation as a nuclear oversight and, and it's just that much more efficient over the issue, understanding the issue, in some cases fixing the issue so we don't have to go through the elevation process. And that's a key part of what we evaluate the manager's effectiveness on, how they use NOS either proactively or when the issues are identified that they don't languish. And, and part of just the efficiency of the process right now is, is we complete a two-week audit. You know, for all intents, that draft report's done at the two-week mark. It doesn't you know, take another two weeks. It doesn't go off in, in cap space. You know, the manager has a plot that, uh, that they can, you know, well, they've already done a considerable amount of work on, but it's a, like a bug product that just lets us go fix stuff and move on. Yeah, to add to what Lou said, uh, a good example of how the line is using nuclear oversight uh, proactively is the uh, electrical penetration uh, placement that we did. Uh, we ended up having to, uh, not having to, we ended up sending uh, a nuclear oversight inspectors to the manufacturer where they were making these parts and to make sure that they're being made according to specs so when they come to the plant, uh, we know they're good and we know they're gonna work. So that's another example how the nuclear oversight is working with the line in a proactive way uh, to make sure that it's yeah. done right. It takes a lot more communication, it seems to me, which is good. What's the composition of the 20? Uh, we have uh, three different areas, and we have three supervisors and about five, six people reporting to each supervisors, and that includes assessment, uh, uh, evaluations, and quality control, and quality assurance groups, and, uh, and another group that's really important, that's the audit, when they go and audit the work that's being done. Uh, all these folks, uh, all three supervisors, report to Kerry Eden, who's a very experienced, a very uh, 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 incredibly strong uh, uh, a manager uh, that uh, has had few years experience and even worked for the NRC for about eight, nine years. Uh, he's, he's, uh, he's incredibly strong and, and, uh, and he of course to me to provide that independence that we were, we were talking about. Typically the nuclear oversight manager reports to the chief nuclear office, officer but in, in this instance uh, we made that change to have that independence so uh, so our president and the board is getting an independent uh, feedback from the nuclear oversight that's not going to work. That's not And then how, and on top of all this, we've got nuclear regulatory inspectors. How, how many inspection teams do we have in the next month? Are we still expecting that on that or what's going on? No, no, we'll continue to see inspectors on a weekly basis. There will be much more smaller, mostly smaller focus teams in some cases. Like energy line break, it's a, a specific technical expertise that the other two will bring in. And that will be just augmenting the, um, you know, augmenting the, the, the two residents that are on site. So on any given week throughout the month of uh, August and September, I expect you know, somebody to continue to buy the, uh, the, 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 the additional inspectors that are closing out the remaining dollars. And it's a plan to mention high energy line break. We get more questions for Mr. Chairman on going to the yeah. board. Yeah. Who may be doing the high yeah. uh, As uh, our people were uh, looking at stuff and <coughs> the high energy line break system, it was recently uh, identified that our previous technical basis for excluding inspecting the high energy line breaks in uh, room 13 of the ox was not correct. The ox is uh, outside of the container. Uh, these uh, lines in here is a 40 foot uh, piping that uh, is original to the plant um, and uh, and then it has never been inspected however it's never leaked but it was decided this needs to be uh, inspected the problem with this to be inspected they have socket welds and you cannot a socket weld is when you sort of screw something into it you can't put in the probe and adequately inspect it so uh, we're going to have to replace this piping, which is probably good anyway. We're going to need piping and new wells. It's going to be about 40 wells and 40 piping. 
uh, we need to um, authorize uh, and need to negotiate and award this contract to site loans uh, services. Uh, and problem again is this is a limited number of vendors have the capability to provide a specialty loan services and for this type of placement and also we have an outbound modification project. It's going to require special field uh, machine machine and welding capabilities as also radiography to, uh, to check these wells and everything. Uh, in compliance with seals bidding provisions, uh, you know, a permit state statute is impractical and not in public's best interest. So we're asking uh, the board's approval for the um, of the uh, authorization for management to negotiate and enter into the contract with building services uh, required to potential modify this in uh, Green 13. So this is something that came up and uh, it was part of our CRs and, uh, and it was decided that we have to get this done. Again, most every other stone is going to be turned here and uh, for safety reasons, uh, this needs to be done. Do you want to add anything to yes, it's safety as well because it's, it's just fundamental for compliance you know, the, yeah, compliance. from original construction that um, you know, this fell out of our in-service inspection program. So we hit it from two angles as we're looking at our in-service inspection program as well as a high energy and break. Uh, we've got to put the pipe in compliance so you can not only um, inspect it now, but it'll be on a periodic I mean, 10 year inspection that uh, we'll look at a couple more times. Okay. Any, any other questions? And that concludes our report. Thank you. Open the information, Director Barrett. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, we have one board item. Uh, we have uh, to approve uh, a change to the 2013 OPPD Board of Directors meeting schedule. Uh, specifically, this is a change from uh, the date set uh, previously of September 12th and move the, the meeting date to September 19th. And the reason behind this was uh, in talking with Ken Burke is that there's going to be a meeting in Omaha. Uh, it's with presidents and CEOs of the nuclear insurance yeah. 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 organization, Neil, yeah. yeah. oh, with the with the Neil organization. So there was a conflict there, and so uh, uh, the best path is to uh, move the meeting <coughs> uh, we can head to the 19th. And then, So update your calendar. Uh, uh, and there's also two reporting items. Uh, there's the, an update on the stakeholders process, and that will be provided by Lisa Olson. And the third item would be the mid-year status update by President Gary Gates. Thank you, Pleased to be here today to give you a recap of the stakeholder process. Um, the public information committee, I'm going to spare you. Um, I'm, I'm giving you a condensed version. They got all the details uh, during the last couple meetings, so I want to give you a highlight of it. Okay. As you know, this has been a long process, a very thorough process, and we're really pleased with the outcome um, in that regard. In between the workshops, the open houses, and the online meetings, we had over 300 um, customers participate, which we were really happy about. And then in addition to that, uh, we had 780 people um, uh, having comments, visiting the websites. In fact, there were over 672 people that uh, went to opbd.com. Um, to check out um, what we were doing on, in that regard. And then on our outreach, in addition to that, another layer, we had nearly um, almost over 1,600 other touch points. And in, in that, uh, we used a new tool with Facebook and we did some ads on uh, Facebook that was, I think we spent, I think, $100 on that, and had um, over 300 click-throughs um, through Facebook on that. So we're engaging some of the younger um, um, customers I guess you could say that. And then also with the open houses, um, we had more of our traditional um, customers as well, which we, we really uh, were pleased about that. Then the last component of it is our natural OPD connections, the things that we do um, naturally through our marketing efforts. Board meetings, our outlets, um, which uh, some of the people uh, brought with them, you know, 
They, they love this publication. They brought it with them. So we had um, inserted that in every bill. So that went over about, about to over um, 700 customers, um, I guess twice. Flash employee meetings. And in my account, we did something new there. We had a captive audience of 97,000 um, customers that are on my account. And so we went ahead and um, solicited them to find out if they wanted to participate in the uh, stakeholder process as well. So it was a nice, a really nice combination on that. So what do we hear? And this is just a high level recap. Um, what people are interested in is with the stakeholder process, of course, generation portfolio planning. No surprise there. Product rebate and incentive planning. Um, they want to be part of that, to the things that we're going to be offering. And I'm very excited about that. Um, with our team with the products and services, community programs. And it was interesting on some of the things that we heard, rural versus urban. And that's going to help us target really what's important to our customers in both of those um, major audiences. And then great changes and updates. No, no surprise there. Preferred communication options, text messaging. OK. Um, they also want email, newsletter, communications. And then they talk about uh, board meeting enhancements streaming video, rules of engagements, and so forth. And remember, when we talk through this, this is both internal um, interviews as well as external interviews. And then targeted communications, rural versus um, urban audiences. Right now, like in outlets, we offer um, incentives um, that may be for HVAC. Well, it's pretty much in the metropolitan area, so how can we reach out to some of the smaller communities and engage some of um, the, the businesses in those particular areas. So the team's going to be looking at that. So, nothing new. Um, this is something that was developed um, during the workshops. And then what we did was, during the open houses, we socialized it, and, and as well as the online portions of it. So what we said was, we're always going to plan, we're always going to act, and we're always going to measure. What's going to change depending on the item that we, we put through the filter is the depth and breadth. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. I've got two examples. Always, what the outcome is going to be, what's the information that's fair and equitable for all of our customers? And then we'll provide that to you as board of directors to make your decision when you're voting on various issues. So let's talk about an example, a small initiative, OK? The planning process, the acting, and the measure. Okay, so what we'll do is decide who on the team internally needs to be part of that, um, develop the protocol and the processes to go with it, then decide what the notification um, is. Is it through the media, social media, that type of deal? But here's the part that we listen to. These are the things that, in this, in this example, our toolkit that we're going to use as a stakeholder outreach is going to be, in this case, example is we're going to use the website, we're going to do our traditional um, mass media, social media, outlets, electronic notifications, and an online advisory panel. You heard me talk a little bit about that um, with our market research group. We're going to put together an online panel that's going to be consistent and it's going to be valid statistically in terms of the demographics of all of our customers. So that, that way we can ping decisions and comments past them throughout the year. Um, employee notica notifications, one of the things that we heard loud and clear was if the uh, the customers are going to be knowing about this. Of course, the employees need to know about it. So we're going to make sure that we're going to mirror that and do it in front of that so that um, our employees we can use them as ambassadors. Lisa, could you talk about the online advisory panel? Mm -hmm. We'll just go to the board and um, show them how we can reach uh, Absolutely. We will use an independent third party to do that for us. And what we'll do is I talk about the demographics. So it could be from 19 to 25 year olds, you know. Uh, 30 to um, 42, we'll, we'll determine those parameters. Rural, um, urban, um, large customers, small customers, and so forth. So it will be a, a statistically valid sample of all of our customers. Does that answer your question? Right. Okay, so then let's go for, I call it the Cadillac. Um, these are the things that when it's a major initiative and we need to engage everyone, um, we'll still plan, act, and measure, but what we'll be doing here is pulling out all of the stops in regards to that as a menu. As you can tell, it's the same as before, but we're going to add advisory group and a task force, possibly. Um, focus groups, uh, because then we can get a little bit more tapped into it than just our online ad advisory group. Determine if we need public meeting and open houses, like we did for the stakeholder process. Community events. 
we're going to go out to the people. Maybe we go to a farmer's market. Um, maybe we go to the county fairs and so forth and make those decisions. We'll go to the people. Um, and then community partnerships. Uh, looking at um, are there things that we need to uh, outreach to various communities depending on the issue. Any questions on that? Okay, so next steps. Where are we at right now? Right now we're benchmarking the data management of the companies. We're getting great information from our stakeholders. Well, where do we house it and how do we utilize that in terms of a segmentation model? Let's say, um, Ann McGuire, the things that uh, you had talked about in the stakeholder process, how do we capture that and so forth so we know really what your issues and um, passions are, okay? Um, next is redesign.com. <coughs> um, the team is extremely excited about that. In fact, we're um, probably, I would say halfway through that initiative, um, 2,000 of our customers right now, uh, we went to on account and they agreed to um, test our, our new website. And what we did was we basically mapped where they were going on the website. And the things that we thought would be hot items weren't. And so what we did was we took what they wanted and then built the website for that. We're not ready for prime time. And of course, we'll be coming back to senior management and the board just to give you a highlight on that, but just wanted to let you know um, the uh, process is going extremely well on that. We're in the process of um, going out for an RFP on the online panel. Um, there are certain research companies that are very good at this, so we want to make sure, first of course, we're going to look um, if there's anybody local that can do that, but also I'm going to look at from J.D. Powell, um, who else does it and who does it well. And then um, board of directors, as uh, you voted on, I believe, at the last board meeting, your um, rules and public rules of engagements and so forth. So that was uh, just in response as well. 2014, we're going to complete the customer database and segmentation uh, strategic initiative. We're going to launch text messaging uh, program. And we've been working together um, with a, a group across the company to work on that with Sherry's IT department and Julie Comstock and customer service as well. Um, we're going to redesign and launch outlets for rural versus urban. We're going to have it more targeted. And then collect customer communication preference for my account. I call this the hook. Um, if people want text messaging and um, if they want to get um, uh, emails and so forth, what we're going to say is you need to go into my account for that. And then that way we can basically sell new products and services um, through that vehicle as well. So I thought we get something out of that as well. And then implement the electronic notifications. So where are we at and where are we going? As you can tell, I'm sure you guys are tired of hearing about this, but um, we benchmarked, we had the public uh, workshops, we drafted the process, got public input, board input, we um, interviewed the public information committee as well and uh, internal uh, individuals. We updated senior management and right now we're at um, August. So with that, I'm going to pass it back over to Tim to talk through next steps. Well, one of the things in this process is, is we've been working with HDR is uh, to really think about um, one of the questions they asked us is that should this be a policy or a process uh, that the board approves? And, and we kind of came through um, that conversation with HDR to say it's really a process. Um, that we would then be asking the board to uh, accept um, and that we would then bring this process to all of those kinds of things the customers told us that they wanted to see and we would engage uh, the customers in this stakeholder process um, and so that's essentially what um, we are recommending here is that the board approve our recommendation uh, it'll be next month of accepting this as in a standard process that OPPD will use as we begin to engage our customer owners uh, on a number of different things that they've identified to be critical and important. Um, and so the management commitment to this would be we implement uh, the appropriate process uh, based on the project or the initiative. We would kind of evaluate that each time we identify a project. We would adapt the process based on the customer's needs, best practice, and our ongoing lessons learned. We'd inform the board of the results on the process um, for them to use, or you to use, uh, in that decision-making process based on that customer feedback. Um, and then you could use that in, if, if the board is moving to a decision, you would have that information to be able to utilize it in your decision-making 
um, on, on behalf of the organization. So that was kind of the um, part that we ended up moving to with, uh, with uh, along with HDR. Different companies have done it different ways. We thought this provided the best flexibility, but also gave us really the commitment to execute that stakeholder process for the future. So when we do the uh, talk about generation or something like that, the integrated resource plan, when that finally is decided to work with them, we use this process. Okay. Uh, you, we have we have one that Lisa and I just talked about, and I said, no, we probably don't need to talk about it, but I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> uh, the Bank of the West has decided to move out of the building where we actually lease from them in, in North Omaha. Um, and so the example would be, this would be a great process to use if we're going to have to exit that building in, at the end of 2013 or the mid-2014. Where's the right spot in North Omaha that we would want to place um, a, a payment office uh, and so we would engage that part of the community like we did in South Omaha by the way when our lease was up uh, on uh, 36th and, and L Street uh, we went to a variety of the community leaders got them together and said you know where should we our lease is up is this a good spot is there a better spot for us to get engagement with um, uh, the South Omaha uh, customers and they said that's the best spot and that allowed um, Sherry's team to begin to go and negotiate uh, the best lease that we could get out of that spot. So it's, it, we've used the stakeholder process in a variety of ways. This is just now a formal way that we'll be doing it. But that would be a, another example of how we would use it. Small number of projects. Any aspiration to that one? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you for your support. And um, we will be on your agenda for our next month's board meeting. Questions, comments, concerns? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, sit back. I don't need to look forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Greg, for bearing that. I'm going to do it in the This is the first time you've done this. Kind of summarize where we are in the first six months in the year. Many of the information, uh, all the information that uh, has been presented at one time or another, but I think it's good to see it in perspective of all the work that's been done by the men and women of OPCD uh, over the first six months of this year. It certainly had its challenges, uh, certainly had a lot of successes, and some continued challenges that we're going to continue to focus on. So the items that we've had detailed reports on uh, at this board meeting in particular, I won't dwell on them. Uh, we'll move quickly through those uh, to be a summary. The other piece of the format we're going to do today, agenda-wise, is our CFO, Edward Easter, to provide a detailed financial update of where we are, showing the financial health of the district, uh, which is good. Um, and uh, we've got some challenges ahead with rent reductions, which we're addressing, as any good company would, uh, based on a report that Director Kavanaugh gave, uh, with some areas we need there. But I think overall you'll see a picture of a company that's in good shape, uh, doing a lot of things, we're engaging in a lot of different levels, and we certainly have a lot of interesting uh, areas to work in. So let me take us back to the strategy briefing I gave a few months ago, and the new vision and mission which we have developed. The vision being a fully engaged organization that achieves competitive rates while maintaining financial stability with high satisfaction. That's the customer piece. Our mission is to provide affordable, reliable, and environmentally sensitive energy services to our customers. It's a balance of all three of these. You'll see this vision and mission driving the first six months of this year uh, very aggressively. So please keep this in mind as you hear the rest of this report. That you're going to see it driving through it continuously. I'm going to start talking about people, the process, and the plants. <coughs> now, one of the first areas we tend to interface with customers on, not only in starting up, as you heard about uh, putting down deposits, things like that, but it's when they have an outage. And the response of our team is, is very, very good. Uh, the top quartile utility in response to outages. A couple of the most notable ones we've had in the first six months, of January 27th, we did have a cable failure in the downtown network, in fact, right outside our building, and could affect this facility. And that was repaired in, in, I would say, pretty much record time for the type of repair that we had to do. Then on June 24th, we had an unexpected storm that resulted in the damaged power lines and had 52,000 customers without service. 
again, the men and women attacked that very aggressively and prepared those. And as uh, Lucord Posse mentioned just last week, they had 92 mile an hour winds go through the Blair area, which uh, you heard about the effect of Fort Calhoun, which was minimal. However, in Blair, we had just under 5,000 customers out, and we put those back in essentially by the end of that day. You might have noticed in the paper this morning, there's an article um, about the recent study just completed up with yesterday uh, by the federal government that indicated that uh, more infrastructure money needs to be put into the power grid because any power outages obviously really affects our economy broadly and also locally. Just to note, we'll continue to look at that report and understand it that's right off the press, but I wanted to make sure that the board uh, knows that we are already aggressive in this particular piece. And as you know, we have what we call a TDEP improvement program, which is a transmission improvement program, which we've been in for well, about three or four years or longer now. We allocate certain funds each year and just update our power system as, as we go through the year to make sure that that uh, infrastructure, that piece of the infrastructure continues to be good. Safety of our people is paramount. Um, we deal in a product that uh, needs to be respected, electricity. <coughs> Many of the operations that we use to provide that for our customer owners uh, are complex mechanical processes, electrical processes, so it's very, very high on our radar and very, very important to us that everybody that comes to work at OPD goes home in the same condition as it came to work with. A highlight, and that's our Nebraska City Unit 2, has completed nearly a year of safe uninterrupted generation between outages. So it, it, it continued to run. During that time, central maintenance, the steam fitter mechanics, passed three years without lost time injury. And they're right in the heart of the battle. They're right there um, in, in requires, requires a lot of attention and detail to make sure that happens. Several awards and recognitions have been given uh, to your company, the customer's company. J.D. Power & Associates, first place in 2013. We'll hear more about that at the board meeting. Mentor Advocate Award. This particular award is very, very meaningful in that many of our employees and associates uh, take their own time to mentor uh, other people in the community. And of course, as you know, mentoring is one of the top ways that you can improve life in general. We did get the Mentor Advocate Award for our participation in mentoring all our workforces' participation, as well as the Gold Well Workplace Award. The second time we've gotten that over the years, this is how we provide our employees a chance to be a healthy lifestyle. And we do that by providing constructive analysis for them uh, so that they know where their health is and we encourage a healthy lifestyle. For them. Treeline USA, for the 13th year in a row, we would receive the award on how we handle our tree trimming and how we provide uh, increased trees in the neighborhood. And I'll cover a little bit more about that later. The area of community outreach, uh, particularly pride to me, is the Heartland Walk for Warmth and the Run for Fun. This is to provide, provide funds for those in our community who do the circumstances or having trouble paying the bill. And we do that in conjunction with a lot of other agencies. But this year we raised 132000 That was a record up from 114000 last year. In addition, we got a $15,000 match from the Keyword Foundation, which could go into that fund. We distributed 2,000 trees in about four days for our energy saving tree program, and that goes in conjunction with the Arbor Foundation. That was that's incredibly successful. A real personal interest to me, and I'm not going to dwell on it, but the 15th annual power drive itself. This is in conjunction with the Nebraska Public Power District and a couple others. Uh, this is a tremendous experience for the youth in our community. They learn about efficiency, they learn about sustainability. It's an electric car. It's not based on speed. It's on efficiency and sustainability. And the participation continues to grow. And as a result of this, um, and the funds we raise, we give out $2,000 scholarships. We've been doing this uh, for 15 years, and we'll have an alumni now in return that have gone through perhaps an engineering program through college, and they're returning now to watch this event. And their actual good statements and testimony of what this brought them and brought the curiosity. We also interface a lot of local high schools, so we just hosted 30 students at Fort Calhoun. Give them a feeling of science and engineering and what their potential future could be. That went very well. Customer care is the top of our list. It's the whole part of our vision on high satisfaction. We replaced our current uh, calling system with a voice over internet protocol. Boy, maybe you've heard of that. It has the capability to properly route about 800,000 calls a year to our IVR or to the reps themselves. It does improve performance and reporting capabilities, ability to route calls, 
so important to us when we get out of here so we know where they are, if we've reestablished it going forward. And it really provides a foundation for future improvements, which would even increase our ability to satisfy our customers in the event that they have a problem out of uh, out or just a question. Moving to the financial and broadly, and Ed was going to cover in detail the numbers. But we went to the rating agencies as we reported in June. It was Director Kavanaugh, our treasurer. We met with Moody's Investor Service and Standard Poor's to provide updates. These are our long term ratings, AA1, with the main outlook for Moody's. That's primarily due to the extensive the extended outage. Uh, we did talk to them. Uh, and also, Standard and Poor's, <coughs> the AA stable. Recently, Standard and Poor's reaffirmed our AA stable. These are top ratings. You can't get better than these ratings with the uh, investment agencies. So we'll continue to work with them, as well as just a, a normal annual uh, financial statement audit. And, and you know, sometimes this gets, well, the way Jewish came in and looked at it, and everything's good on the books, big deal. It takes a lot of work. And it's a really an external look to make sure that we're putting everything in the right then and we're doing everything fairly. So that is really a no uh, source of pride for our members. You heard about the stakeholder initiative. We're very excited about this. We believe this is going to provide a great input to us going forward in every aspect of our business, whether it's our generation portfolio, as Director McGuire mentioned. Uh, or other, any other area in which we're going to make a change to our business, this will make sure we get the right picture and we're not just sitting in a, in a utility looking outside saying this is what we think people want, this is how we think people want to do it. This will uh, allow us to make sure we pay attention to that and it factors into our process and we are listening. Sustainability. This is a focus for our corporation. Uh, we, in, some people's minds, I'm sure we're not moving as fast as, as uh, would be desired, but we are moving in the direction of a vector, which is increasing in velocity. By 2014, we'll have 15% of energy sales from renewables. That's surpassing our 10% goal that we had set for 2020. Our green power program, 5,600 customers, accounts for about 16,000 hours a year. We continue to explore electric and hybrid vehicles. We have 37 of them right now in our fleet including an aerial basket truck. This is a big deal. One of the biggest uses of fossil fuel for us is our idle time. Diesel engine has to idle to get the basket to up and down. Electric vehicles can avoid that situation. And we're doing many pilot projects in the area of electric vehicles, including the charging station bell to really understand what plug-ins work and how they work going forward. We are continuing to look at our wind uh, sales. Uh, we're looking at taking advantage of the can yet this year of any wind farms that are out there. The price is good right now, as we've said before. We understand that, uh, we'll cover a little later, that some of the incentives, we don't know how long that production tax credit will continue to be there. But we're aggressively looking at increasing that portfolio. And we're looking forward to the additional 200 megawatts coming out early in 2014 from our newest wind farm. The air conditioning management program is a success. It installs load control devices on our air conditioners. Our, surpass, our goal is to surpass that on track to have 21,500 participants by year end and 21,500 units that are capable of shedding almost 32 megawatts, just a little over 32 megawatts of peak during the summer load. So it kind of avoids new construction and uh, it's a, a great way to do it. We have gotten about zero, close to zero, um, negative input on you know, the effect of the temperature in the house and having the safety site. So it's just not affecting our customers physically, but it, it, it does a great job. Hey, Gary, just a second on that. Yeah. Tim, you might know, um, how many days have we used uh, that air conditioner? Uh, we probably had five or six days. Well, five cycles. In five cycles this year. Okay. Last year, we, um, I think we're at 10 or 11 10. out of the yeah. out of 12. So, uh, yeah, it was a little different weather this year. I just mm -hmm. so that's a day left to use. And we still had some of those uh, hot days that were really hot over the weekend and they continued through the week. And we used a couple, two days right in a row um, during that time frame. That's been good, well, uh, 32 megawatts. Yeah. Yeah. Start to add up all the, uh, all the savings we get from our demand side management piece. That's a big number now. Refrigerator recycling. We work with Jayco, that's the name of the company that does this for us to haul away old and efficient uh, fridges. And the customers receive $35 when we get that. You notice this picture, and it's, it's interesting that most of us, if we have a second refrigerator, we put it in the worst possible place. That's our garage. That's where it's hot, and refrigerators need to reject the heat out there. So uh, we're after those old, inefficient refrigerators, and uh, we do 
typically to find in places like this in the garage. We've had great response between 2010 and 2013. 7,590 inefficient fridges have been uh, retired. We've also done that, you got, so you've got a refrigerator, what do you do with it? We've got 462 tons of metal, glass, and plastic that have been deferred from area landfills, in other words, recycled. We're not just throwing these refrigerators. And again, this saved uh, over 5 million kilowatt hours of electricity saving on annual funds for them. The Midwest Transmission Project we've talked about before, that's a 180 mile line that goes from our Nebraska City Station down into Missouri, into their Sibley Station, where it goes into Kansas City Power Line. About 45 miles of that line would be in Nebraska. Uh, the Nebraska portion of that would be about six to five million dollars. But the advantage of being in the Southwest Power Pool, all those costs will be shared, shared by all the utilities in the Southwest Power Pool. And that money will come back to the district and we'll just pay what is a reasonable share of that as we divide up the cost of that transmission project. We're also doing a number of uh, growth supporting projects. And just to summarize them, because we do bring to the board on an individual basis substation improvements, you hear about a tough line today uh, following our presentation that we're asking approval to go ahead and put in. Those expansions are for, for economic development, primarily in the southwest region right now. We've got the new one at Sarpy County at 27th and Platteview. We've also got one in Richardson County because that's a high growth area right now with the oil wells that uh, seem to be developing in Richardson County, as well as economic growth. And then, of course, <coughs> In addition to that, we've upgraded our substations for fidelity. We have two large customers that's come in, and there's a high power demand. So as you take these individuals through the board meetings, kind of put the whole lap on it, we're putting a lot of money into our uh, substations to provide for economic development. At the same time, uh, we're looking to make sure that uh, these are smart grid capable, uh, which was a question a couple of board meetings ago. As that develops, we'll be able to integrate those. So we're, we're looking forward to what may be possible to build these substations. We had a, a new process, the NERC reliability standards, so we did get an audit from them, an audit of OPD on the app with NERC standards. We did have a lot of areas we were in compliance. We had some areas we need to fill in some gaps and we'll do that uh, going forward. But it was our first experience going through this audit. It really is uh, something that came out of a power outage on the East Coast about four or five years ago. It was extensive, a whole new set of rules, and uh, we have implemented them and will continue to do so. So that, that's a good process with this new one, and it's taken a lot of our folks' time. Transmission line maintenance. This is where we do our flight inspection every spring and fall. It's the quickest and lowest way to cost to do it. We have 1,275 miles of line in the company that would fit under this kind of inspection. We did that. We found some problems, not much. We did fix them, however we found them. We did a special inspection for the line speeding before Calhoun Station. We did find one issue there we needed to repair, and that was repaired immediately. But with the visuals you get now, and the accuracy of those, it's a great way to, to verify where you put your lines on and what the condition of those lines are. We talked a little bit about our power plants. We are environmentally responsible. That's part of our, our mission. We need to be environmentally sensitive and responsible. Now, clearly, as we discussed, the operation of many of our units, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about North Omaha and Nebraska City. There are concerns with the operation of those units. We hear that. Or we are listed. It goes back to that indoor thing in the future. But I want to stress that all the PPE plants are in compliance with the environmental permits and the plans and programs at the local, state, and national level. And we continually monitor those. Ourselves, plus the independent regulators, have their own set of monitors to monitor the performance of all of our power stations. Nebraska City Station was set a generating output of 93.6% capacity in January, and it surpassed 300 days of continuous operation. North Omaha is in compliance with all our airways and water regulatory permits. Now, we are continuing to evaluate the options for North Omaha. Uh, we, the future of that station will be evaluated through our integrated resource project going forward. It will be a, this generating portfolio, as uh, Lisa Olson indicated, will be part of the stakeholder process. So that. That whole process will be very interesting for us going forward to make sure that we understand stakeholder input, we understand the economics, and that we present to this board a thoughtful recommendation on the future of North Omaha, Nebraska City, or Fort Allen Station. Any of our generating stations will be looked at with all of those parameters. We did have North Omaha recognized in a very special way. Uh, it's a small plan of the year. It took a lot of work from the men and women that worked there, and that recognition uh, was recognized on June 21st. 
Thanks, Seth. Poor Calhoun, you've already had a detailed brief of where we are today. Just a little bit broader picture of it. There are 36 areas that need to be inspected. 11 are or will be closed uh, from previous inspections. The inspection debrief we're going to get Wednesday, which the court policy mentioned, will give us a detailed status of the closure of where we are on the remaining 22. We talked about the 24th public meeting, positive progress. I attended that May 2nd, uh, <coughs> both the commissioner visits, very positive for both commissioners that were here. And uh, as was mentioned, we have a new regional administrator, which will visit, be visiting the site on Thursday. The major projects, which have been covered in some detail at this meeting, but the containment internal structures, that's the additional beams inside the containment, not the actual containment itself. Uh, we've completed the pre-core load, obviously, because we have loaded the reactor core. And we're working to complete the pre-heat up analysis <coughs> structures. Containment penetrations are done. Uh, we'll continue in the post-maintenance testing, which needs the plant to move in order to do that. And the tornado missile uh, pre-reload pre, pre, pre is done, obviously, because we've reloaded the core, and we're working on the heat up modification. On July 27th, the NRC approved our license amendment to the exigent uh, LAR that Mr. Cody Posse mentioned. And on July 29th, we commenced fuel reload. And now it's completed all 133 bundles are now in the core with no safety issues. And uh, the nuclear detection is not picking up uh, the fact that the core is loaded and uh, the reactor is uh, placed back into the reactor configuration. We did talk about message uh, some damage on the upper guide structure lift or not the guide structure itself, the device that lifts the lift. And we repaired that, and right now we're continuing to we'll put the uh, EGS back into the reactor vessel uh, tomorrow or Thursday and proceed then with what they call restacking the reactor, which is putting the closure head on attention and preparing for operation. In fuel purchases, um, as I mentioned before, Congress did include a one-year extension of 2.2 cent per uh, kilowatt hour federal production tax credit, very meaningful for wind production. We're looking at how is our way to maximize and take advantage of that uh, before that would run out. I don't know if it would be ever new again. We'd certainly support its renewal uh, going forward, uh, but I don't know what the what the position of that will be. Uh, but we're going to we're looking hard now. And Sherry Hutcherson's group is looking very hard. And team on what else could we bring to this board uh, that would be a, a good positive addition to our wind fleet. Uh, the wind continues to run well. We're just under 50% capacity factor. And as we said before, 5.6 today and 15% we are new wind farm now. So we, our wind uh, farms are operating well and if we can get more we go. We move now to the financial update, which our CFO will give. This will be high granularity on, on the numbers that you see in Director Cavanaugh's report to uh, and give you a picture of how we look at the total financial performance of the company. Good morning. Uh, just early this morning, Director Kevin Off presented in July uh, financial update. In that update, it provided high level summary uh, revenue and cost information by function and major cap cost category. Um, what I'm going to do is show you um, that same approach, but in more granularity, as Gary mentioned. If you look at the single line item amount, you don't see the variances that are occurring under that total to give you the overall product that you see in those graphs that you do every month. The other thing I'll point out that's a little bit different is this presentation includes actuals through June. What Director Kavanaugh presented this morning is through July. So it's going to be a little bit different because it's a little more up to date. But because it's a mid-year report, we stay with, with June. We have several columns. I'd like to take just a minute and go through the format so that uh, you can follow this as we go through. Um, the first, the first is, as you can see, is electric revenues. And then there are, are four columns. The first column is the 2013 year-end forecast. And that includes the six months of actual data and six months of forecast data. We call that our six by six, six actual, six forecast. And the forecast is not the last six months of the budget. It is six months of forecast that's been updated for what we think is actually going to happen the last half of the year. 
The next column is the 2013 budget. This is the, the, the information that you reviewed in the corporate operating plan and approved in December. And so we're going to compare where we think we're going to land to where the budget said we would land and then show you the variances. And the variances are either favorable or unfavorable. And then you can see the impact on the bottom line for, the, for that category at the bottom of the page. The last column shows where this came out at the end of June. So as we go through this and we look at the revenues, we see the residential rep, the residential class is projected uh, to have revenues of three hundred eighty-four point seven million dollars. That's five point five million above what was in the budget. So that's a favorable variance. Commercial slightly under budget at point three million three hundred thousand dollars. Industrial uh, under at five point five million. The, the next item is the fuel and purchase power adjustment. This one's a little bit different. Uh, here we show 25.4 million. What that represents is the incremental cost above what was included in the budget. So this is above. And the reason it's 25.4 is this is the additional cost that we're incurring because we don't have as much generation today. So we're either running more fossil or we're buying power on the market to replace what we assume would be operational in our projection for the budget. Unbilled, this is, this is an accounting adjustment that occurs. We, we generate electricity and we read our meters uh, of the generation level on a monthly basis. And then we turn around and bill our customers on a 30-day cycle. And there are approximately 21 cycles. And what happens is, when you record your revenues and your energy on a monthly basis, and you build your customers on a different basis, you end up with this differential. And that $3 million is what we expect to have in differential. So it's just a timing, timing true up, if you will, to get the financial statements in line with what's been built. Net retirement, uh, $17 million uh, projected for the year. The budget is soon 29 million. That's a unfavorable variance of 12 million dollars. What what drove that, and what's driven that? At the end of the year, we received expenditures in excess of what we had forecasted. We had to use more debt retirement funds in 2012 than the budget assumed. Therefore, we have less less money available to use in 2013. That's going to come back a little bit later in the presentation. Um, Off-system sale, we, we, we see the graphs every month. We know we're selling less energy into the market than we see. That's a variance of 34.1 million. In total, we're looking at about $21 million reduction in revenue compared to the budget. Mm -hmm. Year to date was, was 10.2. Yes. Can you just explain the FPPA, the variance in 9.8 million how many have that? Uh, it's basically six months of this okay. additional cost. Okay. The 25 recognizes that we're going to have at least three more months of that month. And it's summer months. Okay. So the, the, the month so the summer months is more, more okay. expensive. Yes, okay. uh, we're, about, we're buying more yeah. energy okay. during the summer at higher prices. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, turning from the revenues uh, to, to the expense side, this is, I'm going to, I'm going to try to explain something a little complex on this one. Tie back to the FDPA in just a moment. But before we get there, the fossil, as you can see, is, is showing a negative variance for the year 19.7 million. Uh, that's probably driven by lower fuel costs when we were projecting the budget. And we've also had some, some outages, some unplanned outages that occurred. Year to date, we're at 9.3 um, hundredths. Nuclear, 18.1. This, this reflects that the budget is soon the February one we start. And the forecast assumes a third quarter we start. Wind purchase power, the variance of 1.7 million there. We're actually purchasing a little more wind than the budget assumed. And then other purchase power, 46.2 million versus 15. And this is where we're buying that replacement power uh, because of uh, reduced generation of a lot of resources. In total, we're looking at a 5.1 million uh, favorable variance in, in the fuel cost category, and we're at 3.8 million year to date. Now, the complex part about this is we're, we're looking at total cost here, and this would suggest that we really don't have a fuel issue because we're under budget. 
But what you don't see is we're actually generating less energy. So when you look at it on a cost per kilowatt hour, this is actually higher than what we assume in the budget. And that's what's driving that FPK. That's a, that's a great issue, not, not a total cost issue. Could you go back to the other? Uh, you were talking about that as an obligation rather than as a, as a cost rather than as a, a revenue. It's under the revenue section. It, it is. A, the reason it's a revenue here is because any time, th this is a regulatory accounting a rate uh, issue. And so what we do is if we incur a lower cost, excuse me, a higher cost, which we have. Under regulatory accounting, we record that higher cost is an exceedable to collect from a future FTPA investment. And then we record it in this period to match up with those higher expenses. And the FPPA is for those who don't understand. Fuel yeah, purchase power, I know it is. Okay, I'm sorry. For our guests. Yeah, for our guests, yeah. Okay, moving to the next category, non-fuel operations and maintenance. First item, uh, nuclear production. And, and these categories follow the FERC uh, charter accounts, and they're functional, they're not business unit related. So this is the nuclear function uh, of the those accounts. Uh, the cost is $194 million in the budget. And we're projecting to spend $194 million for, for zero variance. Year to date for 1.9 million. You might say, how is that possible with all the activity we have going on at Fort County? I have another slide coming up after this one. I'll go into more detail so you can see how we get there. On the fossil side, transmission distribution, customer counting, at this point we're showing that we're going to come in under, or excuse me, right on budget. Administration is, administrative in general is projecting $11 million favorable variance. In other words, we're going to spend $11 million less than we had in the budget. This is being driven by some, some cost reductions in the benefit area, probably. In total, we're showing $11 million. Now, President Gates mentioned earlier the need to find $11 million. Uh, we're, we're looking for additional reductions. In addition to $11 million? In addition to $11 million from all business units. And I'll touch on that in a moment, too. So what's going on at, uh, in, in nuclear operations and maintenance? We have core operations. This, is, this represents basically the cost of all of the activities that are going on in the OM category at Fort Capital Station, um, with the exception of 0350 or restart recovery. We're projected, projecting a variance of $24.1 million here. That's an unfavorable variance, uh, meaning we're spending more than it's in the budget. Year to date, we're $16.2 million of that particular category. The next item is restart and recovery. Uh, we're showing $47.3 million variance there with a year-to-date balance of 17.5. Now, as you recall, uh, we, we recommended in September and the board approved using regulatory account. What that means is we, we identify this cost in our own category and then we transfer it out into the regulatory deferred asset and then we spread that cost over 10 years. So the cost is shown and then it's, it's reversed and taken out and the net effect on o m is zero. Okay, so the, that washes out. We then have two other cost categories that come into play. There's a restart and recovery amortization. That is where we take that regulatory asset and we spread it over 10 years or amortize it over 10 years. The, the budget is due the February 1st restart, and there's 11 months of amortized cost included in the budget. That's the 13.1 million. With a third quarter restart, it's 4.8 million. There's a favorable variance of 8.3 million uh, compared to the budget. In other words, we're not amortizing that cost because we haven't we haven't restarted the facility. The next item is allergy cooling. When we have a refueling outage, we identify the cost of that refueling, and then we amortize that or incur that, accrue it, 18 months, over the 18 month period prior to the outage. So if we started operating in February, under the budget assumption, we would start expensing the next refueling outage in February. Well, 
we haven't ended the current outage. Therefore, we haven't started accruing the next outage expense. The differential there between the February restart and the third quarter restart is 15.8 million. Anyway, it's, it's quite interesting, actually quite amazing, that those two last items equal exactly the core operations periods. And they offset each other. It's a coincidence. So believe me, we checked a lot of numbers. <laughs> Come on. Okay, moving on. Let's look at the 0, 0350. Uh, this is the restart recovery cost. In September of 2012, we estimated $143 million to, to, to complete the 0, 0350 process <coughs> on the O&M side. This is the the regulatory account piece. And it was broken into two periods, 2012 and 2013. And you can see in the, in the green bars the cost associated in each period, 113 and 12 and 30 in 2013. What we actually spent in 2012 was 69.8 million. And what we're projected to spend in 2013 is 7.7. So there is a timing issue here. We're spending more in 13 than we projected, but we're spending less in total than we initially projected. 140.5 versus 143. This has budget implications because of the, the calendar year, but when we look across the whole total, it's within the estimate. On the capital side, uh, Nuclear production, we see a, a variance of 20.6 million. Year to date, we're at 21 million. All other categories are expected or projected to be on budget and are generally running below budget uh, year to date. This is another area where we're looking for reductions to help offset that 20.6 million variance in um, the nuclear production. If you look at capital associated with 0 through 50, you can see that's where that expense is coming from. And when we put this estimate together in September, we projected $21 million in 2012. We did not project that amount for 2013 because we were in the middle of the discovery process. But we didn't yet know what was to come. Uh, as we have gone through that process, we have uh, identified projects and, and we are aware of those, we've approved them, and we are working on them. Internal, uh, containment internal structures, uh, penetrations, and, and those, those particular projects are contributing to the increase in uh, total cost uh, for, for 0, 350 to 52.5. So if we take all of this and we put it together, uh, we look at this box on the right. We talked earlier about insufficient, insufficient or deficient retirement account funds of about $12 million. We also have reduced offices to sales. When we look at that, we don't look at the total revenue reduction. We look at uh, lost profit margin, because that's really what comes back to, to help fund other operations. And at this point, it's about $4 million of lost profit margin. And so that gives us about a $16 million reduction in uh, revenue. And then we discussed earlier the administrative and general side that favorable variance of 11 million. We were actively working uh, throughout the organization, all business units, to identify another 11 million dollars for cost reductions. By doing that, it actually uh, slightly accrues the bottom line by 6 million and will get us back in line with a bunch of projections. And when we look at our debt service coverage ratio, which is our primary ratio from an investor standpoint, rating agency standpoint, um, we are back in line with what the budget says. And so that's really what's driving us to, to go and seek these, these cost reductions. So the takeaways are we have a revenue shortfall due to reduced options for sales and we have retirement uh, fund transfers. Budget reductions are being pursued in all business units. Those reductions will allow us to maintain our financial position and our financial metrics. And there is a chance that on the current, uh, the current trend, we could uh, exceed the 2013 uh, budget amount. And if that turns out to be the case, we will come back and request authorization 
to increase the 2013 budget, very similar to what we did last year in 2012. And all of that put together, we're not uh, seeking additional rate increase in 2013. So, any questions? Could you discuss the uh, our bond ratings? Sure. Okay. Um, as Gary mentioned earlier, we got that with Moody's and Standard of Shores. Uh, Moody's has been uh, concerned uh, with regard to the poor capital average for some time. They put us on a negative outlook uh, some time ago. We met with them uh, at least twice this year. We've had numerous phone conversations with them. I think, um, I think they've been fair. I think the reason they're being uh, as diligent as they are is because we have, there's only three utilities in the United States, public utilities in the United States that has the same rating we have. It is the highest tier of the rate rating. And what they're saying is that they're concerned about the cost of Fort Capital and the late restart of Fort Capital and what that will do to our credit. I think we've given them a lot of confidence in our financial position and the fact that we we manage this effectively. And I think that's allowed them to, to sit by, probably not the right word, it's allowed them to give us time to work through these issues. Um, they have put us on watch, which means they've given us the allowable time under the outlook period, and now we're working through the watch period. And so we're providing information to them as it comes about, and we will have to just continue to have that dialogue with them. Try to, try to help them maintain their, their confidence and their comfort level. Uh, standard and Poor's, uh, they rate us double A stable, which is comparably one notch below these. And we went through the rating process with them. They reaffirmed just last month our double A rating. So we feel pretty comfortable and confident with, with their rating. So what would be the effective movies would downgrade us the one step? That's, well, I can give you my opinion. The actual effect won't be known yeah. until something like that right. would happen. I would say, you know, I'm speculating here. I don't like to speculate, so. I know. You're making me, you're making me uncomfortable. <laughs> I know, sorry. Um, if, let's just say if they downgraded us to the AA2, or the AA1, um, I think the market, we, we, we have a split rating right now. So S&P is a essentially a double A2, and Moody's is a double A1. So the market is already looking at us as probably somewhere between a double A2 and a double A1, when they price our bonds. So if they actually took us down to equal S&P, I don't think there's a material impact on our cost of bond. And, and, and I, I think the market has already factored this in. Uh, we do, we, it is important to us. We want to maintain that. We do like to be in that upper uh, tier, if you will. But financially, uh, there would be an impact that I don't think would be much of a we, we estimated anywhere from five, I guess the average would be about five basis points. So five hundredths of a percent in a long term bond. That's, that's my best guess. All of you. <coughs> Do you uh, guess that they would give us some watch periods? We, we expect uh, probably by the end of this month they will, they will either remove the watch or we to take action. We think we're getting, we're getting close to that. So you feel good for I feel we've done everything we can do. I don't feel good, but I feel <laughs> CFOs never feel good. You know, if, if I were, I would say we played a hard game. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well said. You can't get him to say it. Can you hear this tomorrow morning when you were here? I know we got that. Can you hear this tomorrow morning? At this point, we don't need to borrow any funds to fund capital. Our cash position is strong enough that we don't need to go to the market for new financing. We have requested approval for a refunding. Yeah. Um, what's happened, when you looked at the retirement plan results, you saw what happened to fixed income. 
that happens also, as you can imagine, to, to the new interest rates. And we are out of position right now to be able to do that and meet our economic targets. We're continuing to monitor, but right now, unless the market comes back around, we won't be coming Thank you. Just to uh, put a cap on it, this was our, our first major report, so feedback from the board is appreciated. Uh, there are challenges we talked about today that companies are meeting on, staff meeting on. Uh, We are listening to input from a variety of sources, and in fact, we've added our research. And we have a continued to be the national health based on the challenges we have with the future. So that concludes that report. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. 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 Yes, sir. Okay, very good. Uh, I neglected to mention that I did attend one of Lisa's open houses, and it was uh, really well.